All right, well, it says 10 a.m. Central Time on my computer, so we'll go ahead and get started. Great to have everyone with us this morning for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Noah Newman. I'm a strip-till farmer. I'm one of our editors here. And uh, welcome to Strip-Till Cover Crops and Carbon, Market Solutions and Expert Perspective from the Field. This is a joint presentation of Environmental Tillage System Soil Warrior and Foreground by Bayer. So cover crops, of course, they have a lot of benefits. They help keep residue on the field after that strip-till pass. They also break up soil compaction, cycle nutrients, but our uh, but our cover crops right for your strip till operation. That's the question. So we have a, a a panel here of experts to break it all down. And quick reminder before we get started: if you have any questions during the presentation, scroll to the bottom of your screen. You'll see the Q and A icon down there. You can type your questions in there, and uh, we should have time for questions at the end of this webinar final 20 minutes or so, and we'll uh, answer those questions during a Q&A session. So right now I'm going to toss it over to a Tyler Williams, foreground by Bayer Sustainable Systems Agronomist. Tyler's going to be running point for us today. So Tyler, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Noah, and uh, appreciate the, the intro, and thanks everyone for jumping in. I'm sure there are a lot of things that people could be doing, so glad that you're uh, you're able to join us today, and hopefully we can uh, um, Give, give you something that you can use use on your operation or take home with you. So again, thanks thanks for the time and, and glad to have uh, Justin and Brent here with us. And, you know, and really just from today, you know, really just want to bring bring some um, options and some perspectives from folks that are doing this and kind of from different parts of the industry, um, you know, from a Bayer's perspective and foreground, you know, we, we know that there's there are a lot of um, opportunities with strip till and cover cropping out there. And so um, learning from those that, that know the best is really, really what we're after here today. So um, I'll, this is kind of just the, the lay of the land today. Uh, we'll really kind of just do intros uh, with the folks that we have here on the panel and really jump right into the to the agronomic side of things. That's really kind of where we'll spend most of our time and, you know, some of the, the benefits and challenges and the whys of you know, doing strip till and cover crops and the combination of the two. So between Justin and Brent, I think we'll have a lot of good uh, information and knowledge on on what that looks like and and really kind of address some of the some of the benefits and challenges that that we might come along the way. And then, like Noah mentioned, we'll really hit that time at the end for some Q and A because we know there's always some unique um, you know circumstances that might come up on your operation or things that might be in your mind that'd be good a uh, good time to get some of those answered. So. Um, I guess we'll, we'll get, I'll let everyone just give a quick little introduction. Uh, like Noah said, I'm Tyler Williams. I'm a, an agronomist on the sustainable agronomy team with Foreground by Bayer, I'm located in, in Lincoln, Nebraska, and then serves sort of the, the central plains region and glad to, to be able to bring in Justin and uh, Brent today. So I'll go ahead and kick it over to, to Justin if you want to introduce yourself and a little bit about your operation, and then um, we can kick it over to Brent. Yeah, thanks, Tyler. Um, yeah, Justin Crowell, I, again, Southern Minnesota, Blooming Prairie is actually where uh, where we farm. Uh, about 800 acres corn, soybeans with some vegetables, a little bit of irrigated ground, but have been uh, strip till and no-till, um, as well as introduction to cover crops here for about the last uh, seven, eight years. I've uh, been farming since 2006 is when I started, and uh, so, no, excited to, to be a part of the panel here. All right, I guess it's on to me. So, uh, I'm Brent Brulin. I'm located in Central Iowa, uh, not on the family farm, but um, our family farm we had a field day up there earlier this week in North Central Iowa, and I learned that uh, it was started in 1885, um, so going on 150 years on that same farm, very productive, and they've been doing strip till for six years now up there. Um, some cover crops, I've got a lot of background in that as well as uh, an agronomy background. I taught at Iowa State in agronomy for quite a few years, and. I've been with ETS and Soil Warrior and, and evangelizing strip till for about eight years now. Well, le le at least you got it on your farm in, uh, you know, six years ago. So, right, you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to tell anyone if you didn't have strip till on the family farm, right? I, I tell you, it, took, it was a two year sell to get it on there. So <laughs> it's <was> pretty tough. <laughs> I don't doubt that. That's the hardest sell, right? It is. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks for the quick intro. And it's great to have such experienced people here to, to help kind of run through some things. And, um, you know, again, kind of the, the lay of the, the land here is, is really just kind of want to spend most of our time here on the discussion of, you know, how and why, um, you know, maybe Justin, from your perspective and Brent from yours as well is, you know, why to implement cover crops and strip till or maybe one or the other, or maybe what started first and, you know, and some of the benefits, challenges, and some of the things that that you think of, you know, maybe along the way, 
um, you know, kind of once we'll, well, yeah, I know I have a slide for, for each of you, so you can maybe talk through some of those things as, as you mentioned that, maybe we'll just hit on some of these topics and I might have some questions for you in between then. And then, and then I'll go through a little bit after that on, you know, kind of what foreground does, why we're in this space and a little bit on the carbon markets. Cause that's always one of the key questions we get a lot of, and then really kind of hit some Q and A at the end for things that we might not hit on here in the middle of this discussion. And so. Justin, I'll, I'll start with you here, and um, maybe you could just give us a little background on the, you know, really on the how and why you uh, you jumped into strip tilling and cover crops, what led to that, and then, you know, maybe some of the, the outcomes, you know, sometimes pros and cons, right, of things that you've encountered along the way that maybe help guide you where you're going, but also maybe help guide others that are thinking about doing this. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, one thing about, about strip till, um, you know, it really interested me even at an early age. I, I can remember being in high school ag class talking about strip till, you know, in the, in the late 2000s. And it was kind of one of them. It was still a relatively new concept. Um, but it, but it intrigued me at that point. So it was raised on a, raised on a dairy farm. And so again, had, had good experience with, with crops and rotation and, and, uh, and really when you, when you think about that, um, you know, somewhat practicing long-term rotations and, and really understanding, um, you know, how that can impact soil and soil health and, and stuff like that. So, you know, that was, that you know, that was part of, part of my introduction into it. Um, started actually farming myself, um, you know, some of my own acres in 2006, um, was conventional tillage at that time, but needed to find a way to kind of go into this obviously you know one of the things we we find is that a lot of a lot of farms have been doing it you know traditionally with conventional tillage um for many many years right and so it was uh, somewhat of a mindset shift um as well as the ability to do that uh, like I say in 2006 started to pick up some of my own acres and then that really expanded kind of into 2015 and 2016 uh, once i was out of college and and kind of on my own so that was that was probably the the biggest thing, and you know, a couple of reasons. You know, one of the biggest things that I think ag is going to continue to, um, you know, I guess from a from a challenge standpoint is labor. So I look at you know my operation. I have 800 acres, um, you know, separated. I, I farm uh, with my dad, but separately, you know, 1600 acres uh, as the total. And when it's just a couple of us, time and labor um, are are a major issue, and that's probably one of the biggest things that I fought. Um, you know, trying to, you know, how can we make this simpler? How can we make fewer passes? How can we be also, you know, taking a look at return on investment? So those are a lot of things. And, and on top of it, I work full time in the ag industry as well. So, you know, it just, it just, uh, you know, really focusing on how time and, and uh, labor can be maximized. So strip till was really that introduction. Um, first year we had strip till was 2016. It was actually a farm that uh, I'd been farming for a number of years. It was kind of it's kind of my guinea pig farm. I think everyone kind of has that farm that uh, if you're going to try something, that's where you try it. So um, 2016 was actually the first year that we had done it. We had hired the uh, local co-op. They had started doing custom strip tilling. So that was just kind of a natural fit for me to have them come in and try it. One of the things I remember first year was um, the ability in the spring, you know, to just pull in and plant it. Boy, was that just from a, from a time management standpoint, obviously, as I mentioned, I work full time. So during the day I can, I can do my day job. I can jump in a planter and we can plant at night. I'm not trying to chase a, a field cultivator or keep somebody ahead of me or worry about rain. It, uh, it just really opened up a, a lot of time and uh, time savings. And on top of that, I, I think the, you know, really the, the benefit here is soil health and, and uh, watching these farms. As I mentioned, since 2016, that, that farm has been, you know, strip till and no till. And it is amazing the differences in soil health that we see, um, the differences in soil infiltration that we've seen now that we're, you know, somewhat uh, seven, eight years into this. So kind of as we, as we progress through that, uh, 2017, actually into 2018 was when I transitioned the whole operation to uh, strip till. And have been doing that obviously since 2018. Um, cover crops, we started playing with cover crops. I believe it was in 2017. Again, going back to our guinea pig farm, the one we started strip tilling in uh, 16. Uh, tried it, uh, really liked it, and uh, really liked the concept. And, and have been trying to to develop into that here in the last few years. Uh, I think we're on our this fall. We're actually some cover crop is going to go on here this week. But we're looking at about our third, I think this is our third full year of 100% uh, cover crop. And again, playing with different species and, and uh, different stuff like that. So 
really excited. Uh, like I say, as we talk about our cover crop journey, you know, one of the one of the things that that I find interesting is is you sure get a lot of questions from and landlords. Um, you know, and that's probably the biggest thing I've found is uh, I have very supportive landlords. I'm very fortunate in that in that effort that they're uh, supportive of you know in, in you know protecting protecting their land and uh, using cover crops and strip till to do so. So that is that is probably the big thing. But it is it is somewhat fun. To, I get some interesting questions um, throughout the year, and, and people are starting to 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 notice a little bit about about what we're doing and and uh, and wonder why. So that that's uh kind of the how and why and where where we're at there tyler yeah thanks that's good and um so just a quick question on that a quick follow-up and then I'll, I'll kick it over to brent maybe is, is this fairly common in your area you say you get questions and um is it are you are you the, the new adopter in the area or is it uh kind of picking up pace or what's that look like for you yeah i'd say i'm not i wasn't the first but, but i was one of the the very first um you know one of the the things good bad or otherwise uh, we farm you know 90% of our ground is on a major us highway and so obviously it gets a lot of a lot of views right so you're, you're kind of under the microscope daily sometimes with uh, what what's kind of going on but but i would say you know at the time in 16 when we started we were one of the one of the first to um to begin the practice but i would say that for sure strip till has has really grown in in scope and scale. I think as other farmers are starting to see more of it, and uh, um, you know, again, wanting wanting to try, I'm sure fighting the same exact issues that I have: time, labor, um, ROI, cost of equipment, uh, different stuff like that. So it is it is growing, which is it, it's just fun to see. I've got some. I'm, I'm not alone anymore, so it's kind of fun. Good. Good. You, you you can charge them for all of your your learnings that you're that you're teaching them, right? That's right. And actually, that's, uh, you know, one of the things that that's probably one of the, the most enjoyable things for my part. I'm an agronomist by trade. And, uh, you know, I, I enjoy when people call me and ask questions. And I'm not saying I'm the, I'm the expert. But, you know, one of the, the biggest things that I've I've really, you know, gr has helped my my own operation is collaborating with the individuals that are that are strip tilling. And we learn from each other. Uh, you know, there's a group of, of four or five of us that that talk, you know, some sometimes on a weekly basis uh, in the fall and spring, sometimes it's daily. But honestly, that's been the finding a network of, of individuals that are that are like minded has been one of the one of the best things that uh, that I've done for our operation, uh, just to to learn and grow. And everyone's trying something different and sharing that information. So that that's really a unique opportunity I've, I've been able to be a part of. Yeah, that's great. That really helps the the learning curve. Right. When you can learn from each other. So. Glad uh, that's yeah that's a that's a good thing to note. So so I'll go ahead and uh, um to jump to to Brent here and uh, I think I've got a a slide here for you as well to maybe talk through. But I think um you know really what might be interesting is just give a little a little history on on ETS and the you know how they jumped into this space and you know how you know you and knowing your background and and using um you know likely using and seeing this machine get get used quite a bit right. Just if you could just talk through how it works and how um, how farmers can use it and uh, maybe from your perspective of where technology is and where where it's going so I'll, I'll just I'll give you the open floor to to share your your wisdom yeah that's a pretty dangerous thing to do but uh, thanks again for having me here this morning um, and yeah I'll try to condense this as much as I can but like I said I've been with environmental health systems about eight years now um, the company's been around just about 20. It was started in southern Minnesota, um, about 10 miles from where our factory's at now. We're, we build these in Faribault, Minnesota. Started by a farmer who didn't like working on equipment. He didn't like it breaking down. And he was really worried about his soil and, and his soil health. Um, a very rocky area where he, where he farmed outside Kenyon, Minnesota. Um, so it was built. Everybody sees it. They say, this is built really heavy. I said, yeah, like the guy that invented it didn't like to work on equipment. So he built it extra heavy. And that's been a great advantage to us our last 20 years. Um, and we've added attachments or made re um, refinements to it over the years. But basically, the bones of the machine have not changed. I mean, the first few years, they made tweaks. But it, it's a great design, runs on coulters. There's the option of putting a shank in if you want to to put in hydrous on. But uh, we are not anti-shank. We're just pro-coulter. So everything everything rolls through the soil. It doesn't pull rocks up. Um, makes it an excellent tool to put cover crop on or take cover crop off because it doesn't hairpin like a shank might if you're going through some you know tall cover whether it's been terminated or not. 
Um, if you look in the upper left corner of this slide, you can see cover crop that's been stripped through. Um, that's not as tall as, as we can strip through, but um, I've been in chest high cover crop before and watched the guy run through it and make a pass, non-terminated. Um, then down below, you can you can see, or in the middle picture, you can see some more strip till, um, and again in the bottom. The other benefit to our machine is most of them have two tanks on them. We can add um, either a tank, like in the center picture there, there's a candy box hanging on it, or we can just add another one of our tanks up above, or you can plumb it so you just use one of your two dry fertilizer tanks to put cover crop seed in, and you can actually apply cover while you're stripping, either between the row, in the row, or both at the same time. So you can run your combine through the field, run the strip till path, and be putting your cover seed on all at the same time. So that's one of the big benefits to being able to put on or run the strip till and have multiple products at the same time. Because one of those can be your cover crop seed. Um, once you get past probably 100 miles north of Justin, there's probably not a lot of chance for that seed to you know get a foothold in the fall because you are putting on after you um, have run your combine. But it's there in the spring. Um, if you have something like rye or something that'll germinate early, you'll get you know early season cover before we can get out there and plant. Uh, but but I think our biggest interaction with strip till is or with cover crops is actually either going through and doing the termination or going through and and uh, you know making a strip into terminate cover. So yeah, yeah, thank you. That's good. And so. Um... When people apply, maybe this is a question. Maybe even Justin could jump in on too. But maybe I'll start with you, Brant. When um, when folks are applying, are they applying it in between the strip? So if you're going in the spring, are they applied in between the strip, or are you broadcasting um, in front of it and putting it um, maybe on the strip? Well, it depends upon that guy's you know intentions for that cover crop. Whether he wants to you know terminate it all all at once in the spring, or if he wants to leave some of it going and terminate it late. Um, like I said, we can put it on in between the strips, in the strip, or both at the same time. Most of the people will just put it on in the strip. Um, if they've been the strip tilling and they haven't done any disturbing, of, you know, throughout the growing season between the rows, there's no reason that to till that up again. And it's got some residue, probably not a lot of residue if they've been a strip tiller, because there's probably a lot of organic uh, matter that has disappeared through earthworms and things like that. Um, but putting it on in the row is probably 75% of what our customers do. So, Justin, is that, is that what you do? Or have you tried a couple different, couple different things? Yeah. So we actually haven't utilized the, uh, the candy box on the, on the warrior at this point, but what we've been doing uh, just with a couple of the cover crop outfits that we work with, uh, we've tried it a number of ways, you know, we've, we've used uh, aerial application with, with the airplane, uh, applying the cover crop prior to strip tilling. We've actually found that that's worked pretty well for us because the, uh, you know, we have been using the soil warrior, but it does seem like that strip it's aggressive enough to kill the cover crop. Um, you know, uh, when the when the strip tillage pass is made that way in the spring kind of like what brent's pictures are showing here is that you do have a clean uh clean strip you know in the spring to to start into we've also um i've had really good luck you know we've we tried some here last year with uh using a vertical tillage tool to uh, apply cover crop before we strip it and uh you know one thing with the with the machine that was used it was um you could hardly even tell the machine was out there which was very interesting very low disturbance but just enough where we were able to get uh cover crop um, with some some better seed to the soil contact um, we've also had a, an outfit, a, a guy to the west of us that does a, a lot of custom application to cover crop where he has a, a haggy sprayer that's set up with a gandy box and he's dropped tubing it into, into the standing crop. So we've kind of tried it all ways. Uh, we are going to experiment a little bit with, uh, with an outfit that is going to apply some by drone this, uh, this fall here as well. So curious to see how that goes, but I think we've tried at this point, other than doing it with the soil warrior, we've tried about every, every way of doing it. And, uh, Again, benefits and and uh, you know benefits and, and drawbacks to to each of the applications, but we've really been playing with uh, what is the best way to to get that cover crop on. Okay, yeah, I should probably clarify. Um, when I say seventy five percent of our people put it in the zone, and that's specifically for the reason that Justin mentioned, seed soil contact, is if it hasn't been disturbed between, you don't have anything touching it to shove that into the ground, unless you get a really good rain right after you put it on. It's that seed has just been wasted, so. Um, 
for people that aren't, you know, stripping it in, in my area here in central Iowa, it's, it's predominantly put on, you know, with some type of vertical tilt tool or, you know, we do have airplanes down here flying it on as well. So. Okay. So I, so I have a question, maybe, maybe this is maybe, um, you can probably answer this in maybe a couple of words. Um, you know, what, what about like, like timing, um, timing of strip tilling, you know, do you see certain areas that, that benefit more in the fall or more in the spring, or especially if you're doing cover crops, do you need, uh, do you need to run it again in the spring? If you, if you use that to apply cover crops in the fall, it, any, any thoughts there for, from either of you on that? Well, I, I can take a stab at part of that. So we have found that more than environmental or, or, you know, temperature conditions, it's labor is when it determines you run your strip till. So a lot of guys that, you know, it's a one or two man operation like Justin or like my family, we went from four people running the farm to two now in the last couple of years, do all their stripping in the spring. Um, they don't have time. They got to get the corn harvested and, and the beans out. And by that time, it's, you know, snow on the ground. So they do their stripping in the spring solely for that reason. Running the coulters doesn't matter, you know, um, in the spring like you would if you're running the shank because you don't have to shear and smear and things like that if it's a little bit damp. But other guys, you know, they've got the labor where they can send some guy out of a strip till machine, you know, in the field that was just combined, you know, the day before and get that done. So um, labor is a big factor. And also your your management practices. If you get out west of the Mississippi, there's a lot of cattle that are run all winter long on that stock ground. So they obviously don't strip till spring. And that also affects, you know, whether you can even put a cover crop on. Um, and that might already have a, you know, a quasi cover with some winter wheat or something on it as well. So, Justin. Yeah, yeah. I, I would agree with that. You know, we're, we're making our, our fall, our pass in the fall. We're not, we're not coming back in the spring with a fresh and pass or anything. Um, we found that that works good. Talking a little bit about labor, and this is kind of one of the unique things, I guess, with, uh, with our operation, you know, with 800 acres, we, we, you know, it's probably not as, uh, sustainable for us to to own a machine. So we've actually worked with a uh, uh, group, kind of that group I was talking about earlier, where we collaborate. Um, we're able to kind of work together. Um, uh, you know, one one owns a tractor, one owns a machine, and uh, you know, doing some custom acres as well as our own operations acres uh, works really well. So you know, basically, yeah, in the fall, you know, the strip strip till, or, excuse me, the cover crops are applied. Um, we're actually working on getting some of that done here uh, soon, and then some of it will happen here after harvest as well with uh, with the soybean crop. But but again, it seems like that timing is happening in the in the fall. And uh, again, kind of been a one pass system. We haven't we haven't uh, uh, at least in our operation freshened any strips in the spring and felt that they're they're very clean, and, and the cover crops do not inhibit. Um, our ability to plant that in the spring or uh, plantability. Um, it, to me, it's just like planting a, a regular strip. So, okay. And you stick mostly with uh, it's like winter annual cover crops. Is that pretty much what? Yeah, you're talking yeah. Talking about well, yeah. Talking about uh, species a little bit. I, I kind of diverted from your question. So, so we're we're we are planting some annuals that'll come up here in the in the fall uh, fall time, and then you know we obviously always have something that's overwintering. Trying a you know a couple different things. A lot of that's been done with uh, with rye. Um, obviously, planted in the fall, we get it to to establish, and then that's coming back in the spring. Also, played with uh, uh, kale has been a big one. So a uh, uh, brassica, similar to a uh, tilled radish. But what we do find is again, I'm a little bit further north, and uh, winter hardiness is important. We found that the the kale has really provided us uh, uh, gives us a longer uh, longer window in, in the fall. Uh, before it's terminated, we've actually even found that we we have some of the kale overwintering, which is really interesting. Um, has not caused an issue when planting, but we do sometimes see that kale um, overwinter as well. But trying to again trying to plant uh, a variety of of different cover crops, and and again for different reasons. You know, one thing it was we look at the rye, we're looking for you know to have some some green. We're ha looking to have some cover uh, provide us with a more more fibrous root to uh, again somewhat scavenge nutrients but again protecting and, and covering the crown as we look at like the the brassicas the the kale or, or uh turnips um that sort of uh that sort of a cover crop again we're looking for more of a, a nutrient scavenging so and within our operation we have actually a lot of sensitive waters near us um you know, our north end of our farm literally goes around uh 
uh, a fairly good sized lake. Um, and obviously all of our water drains into that lake and we're the, we're the last farm. Uh, there's about 400 acres. We're the last farm uh, to that lake. So obviously we're, we're very sensitive about, you know, night, uh, you know, nitrates in the state of Minnesota, we do have a, a no fall and apply in certain areas and, and 90% of our acres fall into that. So we do not apply, apply any fall in um, over the limit um, other than what goes on with our, our, um, um, our map. So, uh, so that's one end, our Southern end of our operation where our other half of our acres are actually uh, next to the banks of the Cedar river where it starts. And we are literally the last farm before the Cedar river there as well. So we have a lot of sensitive, uh, sensitive areas. So we're just, we're trying to, again, protect not only, you know, soil erosion, obviously, but, uh, you know, nutrients and, and, uh, trying to use the cover crops to help us scavenge that. And again, as, as everyone on this call probably knows, fertility is not cheap. It's a little cheaper this year, but you know, if we can, if we can recycle and, and scavenge those nutrients in the cover crop to make them available for the next year, that at the end of the day, that's, that's our goal. So to be more efficient. Yeah, good. Thanks. And, and maybe kind of just staying on the, the nutrient piece. So, uh, and Brent, maybe you can give your thoughts perspective on how, how people utilize, you know, is, is our, our nutrients a, a key piece of how people utilize, um, you know, a common strip till machine. And then, you know, do they do anything different if they're using cover crops as far as nutrients and how they might use a strip till? So I don't know if you had any, any comments or thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I guess our, uh, our machine, we consider it a system, you know, you're doing tillage, you're doing precision application nutrients, you know, you, you're actually setting up your planter paths because you're laying out your field with the strip till. So once you've done that, you know, you're pretty much locked into how you laid it out and you're up and down the hills and side hills and things like that for erosion. So, um, yeah, putting the nutrients on and putting them right where you need them is an awesome benefit. Um, you do have those mixed into the zone. So typically, you know, four to six inches deep and eight to 10 inches wide. If you're putting cover crop on at the same time, um, you know, you need to put it on with two different fertilizer applicator tubes. One of them would have the seed coming out of it. So it's not, you know, six inches underground. It's pretty tough for a rye seed to come up from six inches um, or a brassica, something real small like that. Um, so, you know, there are considerations if you're trying to do tillage, ap apply fertilizer and apply cover crop seed at the same time. But um, our system has been designed and evolved to manage all of that, do it all in one pass. So again, that big labor savings, fuel savings, I mean, fuel prices again are Maybe fertilizers come down to here, but fuel is, seems like it's gone up again. So um, being able to save that and then pay for your equipment as well. You know, um, Justin, you mentioned doing some custom work. We have a large um, percentage of guys that are just not big enough to buy a brand new soil warrior because I'm not hiding behind it. They are expensive. We're a small company, so we can't buy in as big a bulk to build our equipment. So our materials cost more and we have to pass most of that on but custom work we have a lot of smaller smaller farmers that uh that do custom work either they're putting cover crops on and strip tilling or just strip tilling they make their payments every year just off their custom work so you know when you can cover a couple hundred acres an hour at 35 bucks an acre it doesn't take too long so or a couple hundred acres a day i should say yeah good thanks yeah cr creativity and then and mines especially in you know cover cropping strip till world no till all of that you know jumping into it it takes a little creativity to try to get the equipment get the machines kind of what you have and and putting it to work so yeah no that's a good good comment so maybe i'll do one more question and then i'll, I'll jump into to my little stuff and then we'll really kind of open it up um really just uh maybe start with you justin on some of the the challenges that maybe you encountered along the way or things that you would have done differently knowing what you know now or maybe some watch outs that you would you would tell people that are kind of jumping into this space yeah i think you know um one of the things brent touched on as well is that uh, when that when that tillage or when the strip till pass is made um, they are planting the field and so that's probably one mindset change you know i think typically a lot of conventional till operations you know uh running a running a disc chisel or a, a piece of tillage equipment um is kind of a you know, you got your 10, 12 year old child that wants to learn how to run a tractor. That's a great spot to put them. And, uh, you know, anyone can do 
conventional tillage. And that's probably one of the, the biggest, biggest changes is that you do need um, an operator who is, who is somewhat uh, maybe the planner operator or someone who is familiar with the field to, to make that pass. It's a very important pass. And that's probably one of the biggest things. Uh, one of the big learnings that we, we had once we, we switched over was, um, um, you know, as we talk about guidance lines and different stuff like that, we've really, we've, we've, we've learned um, how to manage that. So, you know, one of the things we found, and it, it doesn't have to be this way, but one of the things we found is that, uh, you know, we run ag leader on the, uh, for, for guidance and steering on the strip hill bar. And uh, we do run that in our planter as well. So sometimes just getting, you know, managing lines, um, that was probably the, the biggest thing we've learned. Now over time, we, we're getting really good about reusing those lines. So every year we can pull back into that field, we can go back and use those same lines. Um, or adjust over. So, you know, sometimes, you know, we've tried with that. We've tried adjusting over 15 inches. We've tried adjusting over five, six inches, depending on the crop. Um, so we played around with that, but line management's a big one. And that's, you know, I, I know, you know one thing, you know, I, I'm at the age where that, that's kind of been my wheelhouse, but I know, uh, you know, sometimes it is, uh, it is tougher for, for those that aren't as familiar with it and the, the generation above me to, uh, um, wrap their head around that, but that is an extremely important thing to actually save and name a line. That is very important. So, um, you know, the other thing too, I would just say is, is, uh, as I look at, you know, challenges as well, um, terminating cover crops and learning when and why and how to do that. You know, I think that was one of the biggest learnings we had incorporating the cover crops into the strip till was, okay, how, how are we going to terminate that cover crop? What are we going to use? Um, maybe being just a little bit more conscious about, um, so, you know, for instance, in this crop, what did we post emerge spray on the corn and soybeans? Um, are we going to have carryover issues when we come in in September to apply that cover crop? Um, just different stuff like that. You know, just it, you have to think through the process a little bit more. Uh, one thing I say is that cover crops marry into strip till extremely well. If, if you understand the, the concept of, of strip till, um, cover crops marry in very well. It, it, uh, I think it's a nice compliment to strip till because I will tell you there's nothing more rewarding than in the spring when you see a black strip and green cover growing in between, uh, in, in between those rows when, when the grass is barely greened up in the, in the ditches. It, it, you know, you're protecting soil, you know, you're doing the right thing. And, and it's at, at this point, not, not limiting yield. I, I mean, that's, that's been the best part about that is, is we feel that our AR ROI is, is definitely higher than in conventional tillage. And, and again, we're, we're very um, happy with our, our yields um, from that matter. One, one thing I do want to share, and this is probably, you know, one of the probably most rewarding parts of, of, taking the practice and doing this. This was uh, uh, last, so it been uh, May, it was Memorial weekend of 2022. We had a, a weekend of extreme wind where uh, obviously if you think of late May, a lot of the conventional till fields were had been worked already. Uh, we had a ton of blowing, um, just uh, just absolutely a lot of farms were, were blowing. Um, one of our landlords, he's, he farmed his whole life, retired and, and a neighbor of ours that I, I took over, um, rented his, his operation and and uh, it was pretty rewarding the one day because I, you know, you never know what that generation thinks of, of changing and mm -hmm. doing strip till and and that sort of thing. And and shortly after that uh, that May blowing storm, uh, I was up visiting with him about something, and and he he made a comment that he said, you know, it was pretty proud that day of May. My farm did not blow. Every other farm in the neighborhood was was blowing. Dirt was blowing across into the neighbor's yard. My farm did not blow, and he was pretty proud of that because he knew that his his investment of of his entire life paying off that farm and working those acres um, were protected in a much different way than he farmed. So that was probably one of the more rewarding parts about that. Um, and just a, just a story I wanted to share, because I do think it's important to have some landlord buy-in, tell your landlord what you're doing and why. And, and I think that that goes a long ways. So. Yeah, that's a great thought. That's, you know, it's always a key thing because we get lots of questions as well from landlords and yeah, it's really, really bettering their land, bettering their soil and actually keeping it there. And, you know, I don't, the wind doesn't blow in Nebraska, so I'm not sure what this wind thing is you're talking about, but I'm sure it has, <laughs> I'm sure it does impact. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so Brent, maybe just a, a, a last, last thought maybe on that from you on things that you've encountered on just some challenges that maybe I'm, I'm sure you come across a lot of uh, new NOAA strip tillers. And so just kind of curious, maybe, maybe what you come across and, and your recommendations for that. Yeah. So with new strip tillers, um, number one, it could be the younger generation, it could be the older generation. It, it's really interesting. I never thought that the 
there's times when the younger generation on the farm would be the one holding back and the dad or the grandpa says, Hey, I went to this field day or whatever and saw this. What do you think about it? You know, should we try it? Um, but it does go both ways, which is very interesting. And like I said, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so equipment is one thing, you know, you've got a field cultivator, you got a mold bore plow, you got a disc, you got a chisel, you've got a ton of equipment that you <clears throat> may be just making payments on. I mean, we've gone on farms where they've got a brand new vertical till machine or, you know, a speed disc or something, and they just bought it and they say, well, we got to get this paid off before we can buy a strip till uh, system. But we have a lot of guys who take a look at all that equipment and say, well, I don't have to do any maintenance. I don't have to make any payments on that. I'm going to sell all that and jump in, you know, feet first and go cold turkey. And we've had that happen. One thing that happens when you do that is it forces you to to be serious about it. Um, there are times when people, you know, have the neighbor come over and do some strip tail or they borrow their strip tail machine and, now, this is a lot harder than I thought it'd be. I actually have to pay attention. You know, it's it's like Justin said, you can't put the uh, guy, that, the retired man from the hardware store in your disc and send him out and tell him to make it black out there. You know, you, he's got to know where to go. How many headland passes do you need? Do you do headlands first or last? Or do you do them twice? You know, how do you actually set it up for planning? There's a lot of challenges just mentally thinking about how to do it. How am I going to tender my fertilizer? Am I using liquid or dry? How do I get it there? How do I make sure that the co-op, if they're bringing it, you know, it doesn't make me wait for an hour between loads. You know, that's not very productive. Um, a lot of management things you have to think through and get through before, you know, you can actually be successful. And I guess the other thing is um, going for a conventional strip till, you know, there's not typically a yield bump. I mean, after your soils become healthier after a few more years, yeah, you'll probably get a productivity increase going from no till to strip till we almost always see a yield bump the thing is probably 70 percent of our customers that are brand new strip tillers come from conventional till they're expecting this miraculous you know i'm going to get 20 bushels of corn more because i'm strip tilling now well it takes a couple of years for your ground to become strip till ground it's not it's not a magic overnight thing so you do have to have some patience um learn how to manage it manage it and then just wait it'll come those are some of my initial thoughts. Yeah, no, that's good. Thank you. And you hit <clears throat> you hit on, you know, kind of a number of, of different things, even both of you there. Just, you know, there's the there's the knowledge and the know-how and the learning that comes with it. There's, you know, sort of the equipment piece and the the flexibility and <clears throat> creativity some people can do. And then, you know, the the ROI, the yield, you know, how does how does that pencil out? I mean, all those considerations have to happen. And I always, you know, the agronomist in me, you know, when, when you're doing cover crops, you have to Think of it as a new crop, right? Think of your system. Think of it all fitting. Because if you don't, you're going to forget the herbicide thing. You're going to forget the termination thing. You know, <clears throat> there's all those nuances. So, yeah, so it's a understanding the system. And, you know, like for, for my role and what we do with foreground is that's that's kind of the big picture look that we take it take with it. And so I just did a, a nice little segue into my own stuff here. Uh, I didn't do that on purpose at all, I promise. Uh, but, you know kind of what we do with foreground is really try to aim at those three things because we know it can be a lot and be daunting right at the beginning when you're jumping into strip till or no till or cover crops or if you're jumping into strip till and cover crops all at once you know there there are lots of learnings and things that come along the way and so you know really what what we do is is so foreground is is Bayer's you know platform for you know anything you know regenerative ag sustainable ag uh, we kind of focus on three things. One is, you know, our agronomy team, agro agronomic support. So I'm one of a number of agronomists across the region that, you know, our, our aim is to help growers that are trying to do and implement these things. You know, can we take the combined knowledge of, you know, farming and, and ours on, you know, regenerative ag practices and combine those two things together to, again, make that transition seamless. Um, you know, I always think back to my dad tried cover crops. I think it was like, you know, 2013 or 14. And uh, he went out there and he decided in the end of September that he was going to grow cover crops. Well, if you decide end of September to grow cover crops, you're too late, <laughs> you know, because then he had to go buy seed and drill it and plant it and three circles with the pivot later, he got an inch of growth and uh, not very happy with me. So, um, but he didn't, didn't want to try it again. And so really we, that's, that's where our agronomy team comes in is to help people put the you know best foot forward and to be successful and hopefully connect 
folks like you all to help do that. Uh, another piece is is the cost, right? You know, we talk about costs and, and benefits and things like that that uh, that we can try to help with to reduce that, again, that jump to getting into something new and the equipment and the upfront costs that often come with that. So we've worked with with ETS and others to to help provide some of those discounts to folks that that come in and, and, and join Foreground and be a part of Foreground. And then the revenue streams, you know, you talked about all the ROI on the farm, yield, you know, pencil those things out. <clears throat> we, we try to bring in other opportunities for revenue streams. Carbon markets is, is one of those that us and, you know, many other companies are, are, a, are a part of. And, you know, that's just one way to bring some of the money back to the farm for some of these types of practices. So um, that that's kind of what, what Foreground is. I'll go through maybe just a couple things there, but but it's, it's a free platform, um, you know, BayerForeground.com. Anyone can go to that and sign up. It's free. Just go in there, take a look, check around, see what you think. Um, like I mentioned, you know, discount. So uh, ETS is, uh, has offered a, you know, 2,500 account credit for any new strip till machine below 250,000 or up to 5,000 if it's more than that. So it's just kind of one of those <clears throat> added benefits that we can come together and provide folks that, um, we know we're interested in taking on, you know, strip tilling or some of these practices themselves. So, again, that's just kind of one example there of, you know, reducing that upfront cost and how can we come together to do that. Uh, agronomics, I won't go through much of the agronomics because we just had a, you know, a 30 minute discussion on agronomics. But <clears throat> there are lots of agronomic benefits to doing these practices, all the things that you all mentioned from the soil health, the water availability, the erosion. We talked about the wind that doesn't happen in Nebraska. Um, it does, we don't get water erosion either because it doesn't rain. So, uh, But we know erosion happens in places. Um, water quality, you mentioned the lakes, the streams. Uh, all of those are going to continue to be more of an emphasis on, on what we can do on farm. And so these practices can, can really be the, the way to, to do that and help with those. And then I'll spend just kind of the last second here on on the carbon component, because sometimes there's some questions on, you know, what 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 uh, uh, what are carbon markets and what are these revenue streams that people keep talking about and how do they work? And so, you know, really, there are kind of four key sources of a lot of the demand around carbon. And, and I'll talk about what we do, but really kind of big picture what it is. And I'm happy to answer questions on some of this stuff as well. But but carbon offsets is one way. Um, essentially what a carbon offset is, is if you um, do practices on farm, you know, reducing tillage, cover crops, think practices like that, you can build um, carbon down into the soil. Essentially, those plants uh, take take the cover, or take the CO2 out of the atmosphere, put it down into the roots, take the take it in the residue, go down into the soil. Um, if you're not disturbing that full soil or reducing tillage, you will begin to build back some of that organic matter and carbon back into that soil. Um, and then there's an environmental benefit to that. And there's an environmental benefit that that companies want to support. Um, so carbon offsets is essentially that, right? It's um, taking, you know, doing these practices, you know, sequestering carbon into the soil. Um, we use models and um, soil samples and other things to, to estimate and measure how much carbon gets down into the soil. That can then create a credit that can then be sold for companies that that can't reduce their emissions anymore, and they want to offset. They want to use their their intentions and their you know essentially their voluntary money to to help aid and offset some of those costs for folks that are doing those practices. Um, so insets is is very similar, other than it's typically within a value chain. So if someone purchases grain directly or within their value chain, they can uh, you know create change and and offer money to to reduce their their footprint and their emissions within their value chain of, of purchasing those products. Uh, low carbon products is another one that's that's coming. Um, it's it's already still there a little bit, but if you um, you know if they want to for labeling or creating products and producing products that have a lower carbon footprint or a greenhouse gas footprint, uh, you know, has value to to we know from customers, right? We know a lot of customers and consumers out there value how um, the products they use are produced. And so one way to add that value back to that farm is is through some of these practices and, and programs to measure that. And then footprinting reporting, um, it's just that, you know, a lot of folks want to know um, what their footprint looks like. If I buy, you know, 10,000 acres worth of grain, you know, what is what does that look like on the farm? What is what is the greenhouse gas footprint from that? So um, these are all, all opportunities and options. You know, the carbon offsets is the one that's more established and been around the longest. 
Um, the Bayer Carbon Program is uh, produces a, a carbon offset. So we have growers that, uh, if you're mostly anywhere within the Midwest um, and even in the Mid South a little bit, you can and you add strip till, no till, or cover crops. Um, you can join the Carbon Program, and we'll pay you per acre to do that. Um, you can sequester carbon and kind of continue doing that over the time, really just to help aid in the cost, right? One and encourage you know, continuation of those practices that we know have multiple benefits, not only on the farm, but but also for the environment. Um, so that was it. I, I didn't want to give too much of a spiel on there, but I know it's always interesting for folks to understand, you know, how, how does strip till fit into carbon markets? And it really comes down to, you know, reducing that overall tillage um, from a full conventional till to a reduced till, adding cover crops within that all builds that organic matter, that soil organic carbon down into the soil. Um, that can then create that environmental benefit beyond the erosion, beyond the water quality, beyond the soil health aspects that we know and all love and enjoy. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop talking there. I know there are a couple questions in the Q&A box. Um, so folks, we've got 15 minutes left of our time here. So if you have things, um, go ahead and type those into the, to the Q&A there. Um, but so I have a first question. I'll just go ahead and read off. And this one's for, for you, Brent, and, and Justin can maybe have some comments too. But for Brent starting out, uh, what is the species of choice when putting the seed down where the strip is built? I don't know if you can have any have any comments there. Whichever one you want to buy. Uh, <laughs> I would probably say last five years, you know, guys have gone from six or eight way mixes to putting down a rye. It's cheap. Um, you might have a neighbor who actually grows it for everybody in the county. Um, it, you know it's going to come up. Uh, you know you can get rid of it. So rye is probably the biggest thing that we see go down through through a soil warrior. So. Okay. Yeah, and I'd say simplicity is, is important with this, especially if you're starting out. Um, rye seems to be the base. You have something over winter. You know, I would encourage if you wanted to do a brassica, so again, a, a kale uh, turnip. Uh, tilled radish, that sort of thing. Those are a really good complement. But uh, I, I think keep it simple um, and, and understand the, the process and, and then expand from there. Okay, we got one that followed right after it that you may have just answered, but you can chime in if you didn't, is uh, what cover crops have been most successful? Yeah, I, I, I think, again, that, that one that I just talked about with, with the, um, you know, the rye plus the you know, brassica. We've also uh, put some oats in, in a kind of an annual in just to get some something that comes up pretty quick in the fall to get us a little bit of cover with the uh, with the rye. Um, a couple of things that I'll be trying this year is uh, some buckwheat. Uh, I'm trying to think of which uh, couple other species that we have. Um, I'm going to try a, a few different things. Um, I know some of the clovers, the crimson clovers. Uh, obviously, the timing is a little bit different on some of those. You know, we uh, we raised some uh, some vegetables for the canning company, and I think. Uh, you know, this year ours, ours is all double crop under irrigation uh, peas after or sweet corn after peas. But, you know, one of the things that depending on your operation, diversity of crops, if you're not following corn and soybeans, which have to be applied in the fall, you can get really creative with uh, some cocktail mixes. If, if, for instance, in our case, um, peas can come off as early as, as uh, late, late June, um, sweet corn comes off, you know, kind of throughout the whole summer months. And so you can get you could really put some nice cover crops down and then strip that in the fall um, where you could have a lot more diversity of species to uh to experiment with but biggest recommendation find somebody in your area that that does deal with cover crops because they'll have a uh, the know-how and and understanding of what works uh, where you're farming hey uh yeah so uh another question here um i think there might be two questions in here um one is can i cut the dry fertilizer in the fall applied by in the row i'm guessing by 40 percent uh, have any uh, maybe suggestions on on dry fertilizer fall applied so if you're saying can you cut it by 40 percent? sure you can you can cut it by 100 percent if you want to but um we are not going to recommend that um you know you number one you've got you know crop removal so you got to make up for whatever your crop's going to remove whether it's you know nitrogen hopefully in the spring um, but your p and k and anything else and you are putting that uh fertilizer in an available area so your roots don't have to get to it you know if it was in the middle of the zone laying or middle of the row um inner row area laying on top it's different than if you're putting it right in the zone so yeah you, you don't need quite as much fertilizer um but you also don't want to be mining your ground as well so um and i know there's very some very prominent people out there that have done research you know and they've cut their fertilizer 20 30 40 percent and it's been good for them over many years 
Um, again, it depends upon your ground, your current, you know, nutrient status and the plans for that ground in the future. So, um, so yes, you can cut your fertilizer. Are we going to tell you to do that? No, we're not going to tell you. So, warrior, so. Yeah. And Justin, I don't know what your experience is with the fertilizer rates, but. Yeah. We, I guess that our, what we've been doing is we haven't really changed our, our fertility program. You know, a couple of the farms that we, we just started farming, um, you know, needed, need a little bit of help from a fertility standpoint. So we're really, really working on a build program. And so uh, we, we haven't changed, I guess, uh, that, to answer the question, we haven't changed our, what we would have, if we were broadcasting that farm versus what we're going to be uh, applying with, with the strip till bar um, just because we're kind of in that build program. And, and, and yeah, I think that, you know, the, the, I, I know where that question originates from because I, I think there were some at, at one point universities that were talking about uh, the efficiency of having that, um, you know, banded or in, in the zone in this case. But, you know, I think from a, for, for most applications, that's that's probably not there. And I think that's going to be a farm by farm decision as well. Um, doing some experiments, doing some some tillage passes or doing some you know different rates with the with the bar to, to see if that works. But at, at this point, we, we've been sticking with our, our same amount of fertilizer that we wouldn't have broadcast past. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that piece about doing some alarm on farm testing up, Justin, because it's so easy from the cab and your, you know, all the monitors we have nowadays and and rate controllers to make a couple of, you know, half mile passes with one rate, turn around, come back, make a couple more the other way. You don't even have to get out of your tractor. You just change the rate on your monitor and and, the, and it is good if you remember where you put those. So when you in the fall, you can find out. But but. Um, it's it's a lot easier nowadays to do on farm research than it ever has been. Yep. Yeah. That's that's a good suggestion. <clears throat> so another maybe a, a kind of a, a question in there. And this one's on cover crops. Um, and so the question is, do I plant oats and radishes for the center of the rows for a 2024 corn crop? And at, at what rates? So any thoughts on putting in radishes or oats, the centers of the row? Uh, center of the row if you're going with corn next spring uh, yeah I'll, I can kind of start with that I guess I, I think that'd be a, a good application uh, from a rate standpoint you know I'll, I'll just tell you what we uh, what we've been doing again probably in, in, um, talk with somebody in, in your area that's been doing it as well as I know there's there's people from all over the country on here um, from I know particularly about rye I think we, we've been sticking about that 40 pound rate with with the rye, depending on what other uh, species you're mixing in there, you know, can be, you know, you can increase or decrease the rye rate. But just some of the things that that we're looking at is about forty pounds of of winter rye is is what we've been doing, um, you know, and then it's probably a pound, uh, depending on where you're at, a pound to two pounds at the most on on some of the brassicas that that have worked okay. But but I would uh, that, that, again, that's just what we're doing. Not saying that would work for you, but that just kind of gives you maybe a, a rough idea. I definitely um, see what's been working in in uh, on farms in your area okay thanks um another question from rex and then i'll also answer one from todd down below on on carbon and foreground and the price and eligibility so currently for the bayer carbon program we pay six dollars per acre for strip till or no till or cover crop uh it, and this all depends on your geography and so that kind of goes down to uh to, to todd's question down below of what what states are eligible so and foreground, you can be anywhere. Um, so if you want to create an account foreground, you can be any location, any size of farm, any county. For the Bayer Carbon Program, there are limitations on your, your county of eligibility and state. A um, couple reasons come into that. One is um, there's this piece called additionality within carbon programs that if all of your county is already doing this practice, you're not you're essentially not eligible. They want this to be a, a, a practice that, that comes with a, a, a practice change that's, you know, not, not already going to happen because, you know, everyone is already doing it. The, the idea is that then the, um, it would have already possibly happened on your farm without the, the offset being, being created or, or paid for by a company or whoever's buying the offset. Um, additionality is one of the biggest limits, uh, not biggest, it's a limitation to carbon programs that I think are being more uh, addressed more and more it does limit overall participation but um that's the biggest reason to why some counties are are eligible or not so um i know todd asked a question about south dakota and and in the program today um south dakota is not in an eligible count or it's not there aren't any eligible counties within south dakota um, doesn't mean that it's always going to be like that which is kind of the purpose of foreground is 
when we get new programs, new eligibility, we, we shoot that out to people that are part of our part of the program saying, hey, there's a new offer in your area. Come take a look if you're interested, if you're eligible, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of changing and moving parts to, to a lot of the, this carbon space and new eligibility comes up all the time. So just because you're not eligible for the carbon program today doesn't mean you won't be tomorrow. Um, and then Rex asked it a little bit on the, the sign up window. We have a rolling sign up window. So um, anytime you want to sign up for the carbon program, you're, you're eligible, you can sign up. Um, the, the look back period, we're able to, to look back and pay for three years of historical practice. Um, and when the calendar changes, that look back year changes. So I always recommend people do it before that, before the end of the year and the calendar changes, because that might change your look back and, and payment period for that historical payment. So hopefully I addressed a couple of those. Um, there are, I think, three or four more questions in here I want to make sure I get to. Um, but this one's for, for Justin. And um, out of all the ways you've experimented with planting covers, which method were you most satisfied? Um, and how did germination and fall growth compare? Yeah, so the the probably the best way of doing it has been with, a, uh, from what I've tried, has been with a vertical tillage machine with a candy box on it. So basically we're blowing the seed right behind a, uh, wavy coulter, doing very minimal disturbance. Um, if you drove by it, you wouldn't even know um, anything was done to it. That seems to be the best. It, it, it's kind of best of both worlds where we're doing very minimal disturbance uh, to to the soil. And then, but we're also just really um, um, getting that good seed to soil contact and uh, good fall growth, and extremely good spring growth. One of the things we find when we, when we try with other methods is that seed to soil contact, depending on you know, the biomass of the crop when it's put on, if it's shaded, if it's not. Um, so, but I would say the vertical tillage has been our uh, preferred way of doing it. So, yep. Okay. Uh, this one's for Brent. You know, how does the Soul Warrior work in established spring covers? Yeah, again, um, part of it goes back to whether you're using a shank or coulters. Um, again, we wouldn't recommend a shank, especially in the spring, but in coulters, with using the coulters in spring, um, you can't even tell that. You know, you had a cover crop on when you run through it. It may be six inches tall. It could be 36 inches tall. Um, there's a lead coulter in the front that's 17 inches, runs down the center of your strip. And then stagger behind it are two 20-inch coulters. And by the time those three coulters, you know, have rolled through there, um, and then the basket behind it, you know, firm, firm, firming that zone back up, you've got a nice black strip that's going to warm up, um, you know, whether or not you had live cover, terminated cover, short, tall radishes whatever in the zone so and you can hey. do it at seven the 10 miles now you know if you are running in the spring you don't have to worry about boy am i going to be planting late because i got in strip till first running at that speed you know a 12 row machine can run 35 acres an hour so a hindrance at all so. okay and then uh, looks like we got one more question here i see um, uh, this one's about soil sampling and maybe either of you can, can, uh, provide your comments or thoughts here on, are there any considerations on where, and you take your soil samples or, any, or anything to, to think about there? Yeah, I figured that question would come up. So what I, what I did, I wish I had a picture of it, but I took a, a piece of plywood and I, I made a mark every seven and a half inches. So basically, again, we're doing four samples in 30 inches. One thing that I do is I pull one because my strip does move around. Um, I pull one sample in the zone, in the strip, and then I pull um, three others outside of that. So I, I'm pulling four samples every time I stop and I pull my soil sample, doing one in, three out. And um, that has seemed to work uh, very well. There's a lot of different methods out there, but that just seems to, for me to be the best of uh, staying consistent and hitting old um, zones that we created in years past. So that right, wrong, or indifferent, that's that's been one that's worked really well for us. So I was surprised that hadn't come up earlier because that comes up in every single discussion that I get to with bus strip kills. So um, Justin hit it on the head when he said, be consistent. Doesn't matter what system you use. If you do half in the zone, half out of the zone, if you're doing, you know, moving over 15 inches or eight inches between years, or you're doing control traffic and running the same zone, do it the same every year and you'll get a comparison between years and you'll be able to manage your fertility much better. So, um, Probably the biggest one we see is similar to what Justin does. Take one in the zone, three out of the zone, or two out of the zone. But be consistent, and you'll be successful at it. So. 
Right. And I, I think we got time for one last question here and, and probably an easy one for, for Justin of, um, do you terminate your cover crops chemically or with a roller crimper or any uh, any thoughts on termination? Yep. So we've, we've used uh, chemical termination. You know, one of the things that we've really enjoyed is that we're able to kind of, it's two for, two for one, uh, applying pre-merge herbicides with uh, with our termination. So we kind of kind of meld that in one pass. Um, haven't done much with the roller crimper just because uh, haven't invested in the equipment. But uh, it does seem like uh, from a from a timing standpoint, um, and, and just an application standpoint, the uh, chemical terminations worked really well um, and, and really don't have to get very fancy with it. It's just the uh, most important thing with it is killing that uh, plant. Again, I'm in Minnesota. I'm up in the tundra. So it, it's sometimes tough to come by a good sunny, warm day in the spring, but we just have to time our application where we're in kind of the, the heat of the day with uh, good sunlight. And uh, typically we have uh, a very, very good uh, uh, success rate with uh, term terminating cover crops in that environment. Good, good. Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, so I, I we're, we're we're out of time, so I'll I'll, I'll cut off the, the questions there. But thanks, Justin, and thanks, Brent. I appreciate uh, you guys taking time. And again, for people that are on, you know, um, BayerForeground.com, if you like things like this, place to stay up to speed on what's going on. Uh, that's a, a one place to go and take a look. So again, I'll 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 kick it over to Noah. But I just appreciate everyone for for jumping on and sticking around. Yeah, boy, that hour flew by. Just a jam-packed session there. So thanks, guys, for that discussion and great questions from the audience here. And a reminder, if you missed anything or you want to share this presentation with coworkers or somebody else on your farm, uh, we will be posting a recording of it on striptillfarmer.com and also our No-Till Farmer YouTube channel. And I believe we'll be emailing it out to you if you signed up for the webinar. You should see that in your inbox here in a few days. So um, yeah, on behalf of uh, ETS Soil Warrior and Foreground by Bayer and Tyler Williams, Brent Brulin and Justin Krell, thanks so much for tuning in today and have a great day. Thank you. See you guys.